Welcome to the video lecture on the story Wooden Cradles by Lalitambika Andarjanam. Lalitambika Andarjanam is one of the most socially committed writers in 20th century Malayalam literature. Her works sought to explore the issues of women's emancipation, social injustice and individual freedom. As a Brahmin woman, she was well aware of the constricting life led by the women in her community and exposed their hapless plight in her magnum opus, Akni Sakshi. She won the Kerala Sahitya Academy Award and the Kendra Sahitya Academy Award for this path-breaking novel. Throughout her writing career, Lalitambika Andarjanam was committed to the cause of liberating women from the confines of a narrow world to which they were restricted. These are some of the major works of Lalitambika Andarjanam. Atma Gatakya Oramukam, her autobiography. Modu Badatil, that was published in 1946. Kili Vadri Lode in 1950. Kudum Ninna in 1951. Kannilinda Punjiri in 1955. Akni Pushpangal, which was published in 1960, and Sita Mudal Satyavadi Vare in 1972. Now let's read and analyze the story Wooden Cradles. Wooden Cradles. These are events that took place a long time ago, events that go far back as the memory of a 30 year old woman can take her. You all know how much a little child between the ages of three and nine, especially a little girl, delights in listening to someone telling old legends. And if she has an old woman servant at her command, her happiness is complete. She asks a thousand questions and must be given reasons for everything that happens. Whom does the kitchen cat call out to when it mews all the time? Why are the cat and the dog at each other's throats? Is it because they are brothers? When the mother sparrow goes out from the nest every morning in search of food, aren't the baby sparrows afraid to be by themselves? Doesn't the sky mother get furious when her children overturn her box of vermilion every day, morning and evening? And so they sprout endlessly, the young tendrils of curiosity. The cherished darling of a wealthy family can exercise many unjust privileges over the servants in the household. She will ride nothing but a human horse. She must be told a dozen stories before she will drink a glass of milk. At the end of a crowded day, if she must desist from further mischief and go to sleep, her old slave must sing every song she knows. <laughs> Uncle Moon was exhausted for he had been wandering all day in search of food for his starving wife and children. At last, by dusk, he had found a handful of broken rice grains. On his way home across the fast sky, he slipped and the rice grains scattered and became stars. The little one interrupts to ask innocently, and are the children still crying for food? When the sky turns dark, when lightning flashes and the thunder roars, we know that the Lord of the skies is preparing for war. The Great One, the Sun, set out in his royal chariot to marry the daughter of the Lord of the skies. A demon stopped him on the way and would not let him go on. The Lord of the skies whirled his sword. The thunder you hear is the demon roaring in pain. And the raindrops you see are the tears of the bride and her attendants, distraught with the fear that the wedding will never take place. Infant logic must clear a doubt. And did the wedding take place? We all learned our first lessons in life from such women. It was forbidden to swim in the tank next door because two people once drowned in it. If little girls went to play under the Ilangi tree, a yakshi would tear them to pieces. If you played with your shadow, you would be born a demon in your next life. As we approach the last stage of childhood, these old women begin to seem as useless to us as antiquated wooden cradles. Their hands suddenly feel coarse and rough, and yet the crude images that these roughened nails, once etched on the tender walls of a child's mind, continue to gleam fitfully beneath 
the winning of time now clear now indistinct so the story begins with the narrator's nostalgic memories of her childhood she wistfully remembers the love and care that was showered on her by her nanny nangeli ben she was not a mere caretaker but one who narrated countless stories and sang innumerable songs and played endlessly with the children in the household and it is this care of nangeli that made the children feel special and cherished the narrator remembers in vivid detail all the tales narrated by nangeli ben the story of uncle moon the story of the lord of the skies and nangeli ben had so much love for them that you know she never reacted to their questions with impatience she always answered the questions with endless patience all the innocent and curious questions of the children were answered always yet as the children grew up they slowly grew distant from nangeli and to the children she was like an antiquated wooden cradle one when you are a baby you have need of a wooden cradle but once you grow up wooden cradles are useless and nangeli penna also became the same she became useless as far as the children were concerned so we continue with the story once i was 13 i had no time for nangeli penna her house was a good 10 miles from ours she had come to us when she was 11 years old when my father was still a child she had lived with us a part of the family for 62 years till she was old and helpless no one in her family had cared to arrange a match for her so she had never married although she was unmarried she always had children whom she could call her own their jewels were hers and their toys too she shared their illnesses and all their pleasures one by one each child in the family became her charge as she relinquished each little one who had learned to walk on its own another newborn was placed in her arms she would hold it closely and proudly chant god gave this little baby to parents who longed for one god gave this little baby to mangeli who longed for one she had some generations of babies to sleep with her cradle songs her affection flowed generously from father to daughter uncle to nephew every child in the family grew up under her care and yet when she fell seriously ill in her 73rd year with rheumatic pains and chills our foster mother had no home that she could call her own when nangeli ben left us my youngest brother the eighth in the family was 3 years old she bathed him placed a talagam on his forehead dressed him in a silk shirt and trousers and kissed him Her eyes full of tears. Who would be Mangeli Penna's baby now? He was my mother's last child. There would be no more babies in the Parvar. Mangeli Penna was old and sick now, and she no longer wanted to stay in a house where the other servants jeered at her. She was far too proud to stay where she was not needed. All the same, she was unutterably sad when she said goodbye to us. She kissed each of us children in turn. and then asked me in a voice choked with tears will you think of me child when you are married and living happily with your husband i'll come for your wedding i was furious i hated anyone talking to me about marriage two of my younger aunts had recently been married and both had left the house weeping they seldom came home now who would look after my flower pots my pictures my cupboard my books if i went away as they had done In that case, I said gruffly to Nangeli Ben, "You need never come back." And I moved away from her. She often asked my eleven-year-old brother, "When you have got your B.A. and all, what will you give Nangeli Ben?" He detested her, would never go to her. Get away from me! You will stain my clothes with your snot. In the end, Nangeli Ben realized what had happened. All the little ones whom she had hatched in the loving warmth of her hands. had become birds that soared in the skies they would find tall trees to build nests in they would revel in the wide firmament they would never come back to the little nest of broken twigs they had once been content with one of nangeli penna's distant relatives had a granddaughter who had a baby every year she wouldn't go out to work she couldn't go out to work because of the little ones 
Nangeliyama arrived and took charge. Over the next four years, she had the good fortune to have five babies to care for. None of the children wanted their mother. They preferred their new grandmother. So here you see the sad life of Nangeli. She had come to the narrator's house an 11 year, as an 11 year old and had been, had been taking care of several generations of children in the family. In spite of her loving administrations, the children would invariably turn away from her as they grew up. She had dedicated her life to the family and in a moment of brutally honest introspection, the narrator comments that they were ungrateful and unkind to her. She says, every child in the family grew up under her care, Nangeli Penna's care, and yet when she felt seriously ill with rheumatic pains and chills, our foster mother had no home that she could call her own. Though Nangeli considered the children as her own, the children in turn treated her with barely concealed disdain. Uh, the narrator was rather harsh to Nangeli, said that you know you need never come back because Nangeli made the mistake of talking about her wedding. The narrator's brother says, uh, don't come near me because you would stain my clothes with my snot. They, these children, they forgot the fact that it was this woman who raised them up. And as she grows old, Nangeli decides to leave the house as she was a lady with pride and dignity. She did not want to stay in a house where she was no longer needed. She did not want to stay in a place where other young servants would laugh at her, would make fun of her. So she moved to a distant relative's house to take care of the children there. The years went by. Despite all my protests, I had to give in and get married. Nangeli Penna did not come to my wedding. Instead, her granddaughter brought us the news. It started with a fever and a chill. She didn't even last two hours. Oh, me, the little one is still crying. She refuses to eat because she wants her grandmother. In time, I had a baby too. I hunted everywhere for a live wooden cradle that would keep my child away from fire and water, calm him when he cried, and look after him with care. The memory of Nangeli Penna came alive again and touched my heart. The old servant had been dead for years now. No one like her could be found in our part of the country. Her granddaughter had her own children and grandchildren to look after. Indeed, all the mothers and grandmothers I knew had children of their own to care for. After a long and arduous search, I found someone named Panumadi. She was 14, had never handled babies before, and was herself a child. When the baby cried, she would not come anywhere near him. And anyway, it would have been no use if she did. The baby burst into tears every time he saw her cross face. I caught myself remembering the innumerable ways in which Nangeli Penma used to coax a factious child into good humor again. She would twist her lips in an expression of reproach, widen her eyes, hold out her arms and say, Did you hear the drums, little one? There he comes, the Kavadi man. If you don't come with me, little one, Nangeli Penna will go off by herself. Which child would, could resist her invitation? From our upstairs window, we could see the Nagamala range enveloped in clouds, two strange rock formations that looked like demons covered in smoke lay between two of its peaks. They were known as Pandi and Pandiyati. Whenever a child cried, Nangeli Panna would say, Look at Pandi and Pandiyati. God turned them into rocks because they were obstinate and willful. The most disobedient child would give in to this threat for no one wanted to turn into a rock that could not move. And then, of course, Nangeli Penna had to repeat the oft-told story once more with new embellishments. She would sit on the floor, her legs outstretched, eager to start, and the children would crowd around her, their eyes wide with delight, saying, Tell us, how did Pandi and Pandiyati turn into rocks? Drumming gently on her knees, the old storyteller would begin, Once upon a time, in the kingdom of Pandi, there lived a king and a queen. The king had a gold chariot that took him wherever he wanted to go, and the queen had a gold chain that gave her whatever she wished for. One day, they came to hunt in Nagamala. The king, tired and thirsty after a long day's hunt, sat down on a rock. There was not a drop of water anywhere near. 
He prayed, Lord of Nagamala, if a pond appears here now, I'll make you a handsome offering. Amazing! A spring gurgled toward them from the top of the mountain. They took a handful of water in the hollow of their hands and drank, and their hunger and thirst were quenched. The exhausted queen prayed, Lord of the mountain, if you build me a palace here, I too will make you a worthy offering. Astonishing! A seven-story mansion appeared magically. Its floor was of gold, its walls of precious gems. The king and the queen slept in it and woke up on the third day. They were loath to leave. The king said, if I sell the entire Pandey kingdom, I'll never have as much gold as there is here. Let's take as much as we can in our chariot. The queen said, I'll not find a single gem as lovely as these in the whole treasury. I must have one for my chain. Disgusted with their cupidity, God decided to punish them. You can stay here forever and enjoy the gold and the gems. And he turned them both into rocks. So you see, my children, how evil we can be. Much later in her life, as the narrator becomes a mother, the narrator realizes Nangeli's worth. She acknowledges that Nangeli was indeed a rare gem who was unconditional in her love and care. And we have the inexperienced Banamadi acting as a foil to Nangeli. Banamadi was brought in to take care of the narrator's child. Banamadi herself was a child. She had no patience for the baby. And whenever the baby saw Banamadi, the baby would just burst into tears. So the narrator longs for the presence of Nangeli who would have made the life of her child joyous. She remembers her own childhood and realizes that her childhood was special because of the presence of Nangeli. She remembers all the minute details of her childhood and in every memory one sees the presence of Nangeli. Okay? And she says, uh, the memory of Nangeli Panna came alive again and touched my heart. The old servant had been dead for years now. No one like her could be found in our part of the country. So Nangeli was such a special person, but when she was around, the narrator and her siblings couldn't understand her worth. Now that the narrator uh, finally became an adult and had a child of her own, she realizes the kind of love and the kind of kindness that Nangeli had once showered on them. These grandmother's tales, which have their origin in superstitions, stay long in our minds, complete with the moral that is related to life. But the women who narrated them, women like Nangeli Pena, are no more. Today's children no longer have old-fashioned wooden cradles. They have pretty bunched ones of fine net. Old, sweet country songs have been forgotten and recorded music has taken their place. But the heart of a child does not change. One day, when thunder roared and rain swished down, my son asked me, What is that thudding on the roof, Amma? I knew what it was. Sea water becomes water vapor, rises, cools, and falls as rain. When clouds collide, sparks of electricity are ignited, and there is lightning and thunder. I knew. But all the same, I said to him, It is the Lord of the skies making ready for war. So as the story ends, the narrator understands with sorrow that women like Nangeli are special and that they can never be replaced. Nangeli is the symbolic wooden cradle who made the narrator's childhood special. Her own child, the narrator's own child might have a new cradle made of fine net, you know, something that looks very beautiful. But this cradle, this new net cradle can never have the warmth of a wooden cradle. The narrator realizes that Nangeli's love made her feel cherished and that that feeling can never be replaced. And as the story ends, she recounts the same tales that once Nangeli narrated. She pays a silent homage to Nangeli's memory by narrating the same stories to her own child. Now let's take a look at the setting of the story. The story is set primarily in the memories of the narrator and you have a nostalgic trip back to her own childhood and she contrasts her childhood with that of her child and finds the latter wanting. 
So the memories of the childhood are embellished by the various song, stories and songs sung by Nangeli. And the narrator acknowledges the beauty and vitality of these nuggets. So there's a contrast between the glorious past and the present. So despite the passage of time, the memories remain warm and alive because of Nangeli's unconditional love. We move on to the characters in the story. The narrator, who is a 30-year-old woman, she is regretful of the way in which she treated her nanny. She thinks back about her time with Nangeli and acknowledges her own callous behavior. She is also very honest in her self-assessment and realizes the ingratitude that she and her siblings had perpetuated, or rather she and her family had perpetuated. She understands the beauty of her childhood and wishes the same for her child, her own child. Then you have Nangeli, who is a woman who is the symbol of unconditional love, a life of sacrifice and solitude. That is what Nangeli's life amounts to. Though she took care of several children, none of them loved her the way she deserved. And she is also a very dignified lady who never wished to be a burden on anyone. Okay, so she lived her life without any expectations. Let's take a look at the major themes in the story. The first theme is nostalgia. The story is drenched in nostalgia as the narrator remembers her childhood. The old stories and songs bring out the beauty of a past that has long disappeared. Nangeli is also remembered with fondness and it is the nostalgic trip to the narrator's past that reveals the true worth of Nangeli's character. So wooden cradle here becomes a symbol of the golden past that has been lost. The next theme is the theme of unconditional love. Nangeli here is the symbol of unconditional love. Though she never received acceptance or love, she remained steadfast in her care and devotion towards the children. Nangeli's love is special because it is selfless. She doesn't have any expectations. She never expected anything in return for her love and it is this love that made the narrator's childhood special. The narrator realizes that such women, women like Nangeli, are extremely rare and that she should have cherished Nangeli when she had the chance. The last theme is childhood. The story is a celebration of childhood. The narrator remembers with fondness her childhood and its colorful memories. Nangeli, as she plays with the children, she also becomes a child. Childhood is also the time of innocence and it is when the children grew up that they behaved disdainfully towards Nangeli. So the story ends with the narrator trying to make her son's childhood special and thus we can see that, you know, it sort of comes full circle. I hope all of you understood the story. Thank you.